Hey everyone, Path here. Now, many of you have asked me to discuss Lagrangian mechanics in one of my videos, and so I thought we'd take a look at the basics. If you enjoyed this video, then please do hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content. Hit that bell button if you'd like to be notified when I upload, and please do check out my Patreon page if you'd like to support me on there. All right, let's get into it. Now, Lagrangian mechanics revolves around one central quantity known as the Lagrangian. Named after Joseph-Louis Lagrange, it is denoted with the capital letter L, although sometimes when handwritten, we'll use a squiggly curly L rather than a normal uppercase L. And this quantity, the Lagrangian, is defined as the kinetic energy of the system that we happen to be studying minus the potential energy of that system. In this case, kinetic energy is represented by capital T and potential energy by capital V. Now, there are a couple of things worth mentioning here. The type of Lagrangian mechanics that we will be discussing is based on classical physics. So we're using the classical kinetic energy and potential energy. We're not looking at any relativistic or quantum mechanical additions to Lagrangian mechanics. So basically everything we'll be looking at today is based on stuff like, you know, Newton's laws of motion or the fairly intuitive physics that came well before relativity or quantum mechanics. And secondly, the Lagrangian is indeed defined as the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. The Lagrangian is not necessarily a physically useful quantity. It is a mathematically useful quantity. What do I mean by this? Well, basically, the kinetic energy minus the potential energy of a system doesn't really represent anything physical per se, unlike another quantity known as the Hamiltonian, which is defined as the kinetic energy plus the potential energy, which can be thought of as the total energy of the system. But the Lagrangian T minus V, kinetic energy minus potential energy, is a mathematically useful quantity, as we will see later. By the way, there's also a whole other branch of physics that deals with the Hamiltonian, Hamiltonian mechanics, and you'll also see this crop up in a different form in quantum mechanics. But that discussion is for a separate video. Today we'll stick with the Lagrangian. So. The Lagrangian deals with the kinetic and potential energies of a system. Let's take a look at an example of how we go about doing that. Let's consider one of my favorite basic systems, the classic mass attached to a spring. Let's also keep things simple and assume that we've got an ideal system, which means that all of the mass is in the mass. We don't worry about the mass of the spring. And let's also assume that the mass block is on a frictionless surface, which means there's no friction between the mass and the floor. The system can therefore just ping back and forth once we set it oscillating. Now these idealizations are obviously just there to make the scenario easier to understand and the maths easier to follow. So let's look into the maths. Let's find the Lagrangian for this system. What is the kinetic energy of this system? Well, let's recall that kinetic energy is defined as half mv squared, where m is the mass of the object we happen to be considering, and v is the speed with which it moves. At this point, we can also define the distance moved by our mass away from its natural position. And we'll call this distance x. The natural position, of course, refers to when the spring is neither extended nor compressed. And then we can recall that the speed of an object is equal to the distance moved per unit time. Some of you may be familiar with the expression v is equal to delta x divided by delta t, where delta x is the change in the distance moved by an object, and delta t is the time taken for that change to occur. Or, using calculus, we can say that v, the speed, is equal to dx by dt, the rate of change of the distance moved by the object, or simply how quickly the object moves. Now, just as a little notation thing, another way to write dx by dt is simply as x with a dot on top. This is, like I say, just a notation thing. It just makes our maths look a bit cleaner, but the dot represents the d by dt bit. So we can say that the kinetic energy of this system now is equal to half m x dot squared. And the reason we write it in terms of x dot rather than just the velocity v will become clear very shortly. Now, what about the potential energy of our system? Well, this is where we really need to think about the spring. Let's recall that the potential energy stored in a spring is equal to half k x squared, where k is known as the spring constant or stiffness of the spring, and x is either the compression or extension of the spring away from its natural position. And at this point, we can combine our two expressions for the kinetic and potential energies and stick them into our definition of the Lagrangian. L is equal to T minus V. The Lagrangian is equal to kinetic energy minus potential energy, which is equal to half m x dot squared minus half k x squared. And that's how we find the Lagrangian for this particular system. Now what? Well, this is where things take off a little bit in terms of intensity and complexity for Lagrangian mechanics. As it turns out, the Lagrangian is a quantity that heavily features in an equation 
known as the Euler-Lagrange equation. It looks something like this. This equation looks super complicated, but we'll be looking at some of its most important aspects. First of all, we can notice that it contains the Lagrangian. Now, the Euler-Lagrange equation is actually consistent with Newtonian classical mechanics. We won't talk about why that's true, we'll save that for another video, but let's just assume that it is for now. If you're keen to find out more about this equation though, I'll leave some resources in the description box below, and I highly recommend you look up calculus of variations. Anyway, so we've got this generic equation, the Euler-Lagrange equation, and we can take our Lagrangian for a specific system and plug it in to our equation. This will tell us something about that system. In fact, when we plug in the Lagrangian, what we'll find is known as the equation of motion for our system. We'll go through the details of this derivation in a second, but essentially what we find is that the mass of the block m multiplied by the acceleration x double dot, that's the second derivative, or d2x by dt squared, is equal to minus kx. Of course, k is the spring constant and x is the displacement of the block. Now, this equation might look a little bit familiar. We've already mentioned that x double dot is the acceleration of the block, which means that we're just stating something about the forces acting on our system. Essentially, the net force on our system, ma, is equal to the force exerted by the spring, minus kx. And the spring force is just negative because it acts in the opposite direction to the displacement of the block. Now, this equation is known as the equation of motion, and we could have easily just found it by considering the forces in our system and saying that the net force is equal to all of the forces acting on our system, in this case, just the spring force. So why did we go the long way around? Finding the Lagrangian, plugging it into the Euler-Lagrange equation, dealing with lots of complicated calculus, and then arriving at something which we could have done very quickly if we'd considered forces. Well, there's a few different reasons for this. Firstly, the Lagrangian method actually gives us the equation of motion without having to think about forces at all. We only need to consider energies. In some cases, this is actually much more convenient, and certainly it's just another way of getting to the same result. But actually, there's a lot more to it than that. For more complicated systems, it can be very finicky and annoying to have to deal with lots of different forces. And it's much easier in many cases to deal with energies. Obviously not in this case, but certainly is true for other cases. Additionally, when we were looking at our system, we were only considering one coordinate, the x-coordinate. But in other systems where there's motion going on in lots of different directions, x, y, and z, or r theta phi, depending on which coordinate system you're using, it becomes much easier to use the Euler-Lagrange equations because they're very good at dealing with multiple coordinates and they actually give us an equation for each coordinate. In this case, we've got an equation in x and then we could also have an equation in y and z if we had motion in those directions. Now, as we've mentioned already, this is just one rather simple example of how we can apply the Euler-Lagrange equations to any system we happen to be considering. The more complicated the systems get, the more useful the Euler-Lagrange equations become, and the more handy it becomes to work with Lagrangian mechanics. But Lagrangian mechanics goes even deeper than anything we've discussed today. For example, some of you may have heard of Noether's theorem, named after Emmy Noether, which says that there is a fundamental link between any symmetries in our universe and conservation laws, like conservation of energy and conservation of momentum. Those are directly related to specific types of symmetry in our universe. Now that is a very hand-wavy statement from me. I haven't even described what I mean by symmetries, but we'll talk about that in a separate video about Noether's theorem. The point though is that Lagrangian mechanics is extremely handy, extremely clever, and extremely deep. And so I think the big takeaways are the fact that we have a quantity known as the Lagrangian, defined as the kinetic energy minus the potential energy, the fact that this is just a mathematically useful quantity rather than a necessarily physical one, and the fact that there is this equation, the Euler-Lagrange equation, which at the moment looks like it came out of nowhere, but it is consistent with Newtonian mechanics and classical physics, basically. And with all of that being said, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please do hit the thumbs up, subscribe for more fun physics content, and hit that bell button if you'd like to be notified when I upload. And please do check out my Patreon page if you'd like to support me on there. Thanks very much for all your support as always, and I will see you very soon.